Welcome, 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 welcome. Well, you may not know the person beside you, so let's go ahead and say hi. How are you? And uh, it's cold outside. Some of you are like, yeah, I know it is cold out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we're glad you're here today. Again, let's welcome those that are watching on uh, YouTube with us. And let's just welcome them. You're warm. We're, we're, we're cold. Well, we're glad you're watching. We started a teaching series for the brand new year last weekend called Everyday Victory. And uh, this is the third time that I have named a teaching series by that title, Everyday Victory. Uh, our mission at Victory is to lead people to a new victory in Christ. And so several years ago, I kind of developed this personal mantra to have an everyday victory. Um, I think so often we can find ourselves wondering, like, like, what's my next victory? And for some people, coming to church is a victory, and you may only experience two victories a year. And maybe you know people who only come to church on Christmas and Easter, and they're like, that's the... You know, that, that's, that's, you know, a victory for me. And so I, I tell people a lot, I want you to experience every single day something new in your faith. Because I don't think that I've got my faith all figured out. I don't think that I've got this, you know, this thing called being a follower of Jesus, you know, uh, mastered yet. And so every day I'm asking God to refine me, to bring me into a new level, to create an everyday victory in me. Uh, for this teaching series, we, we do have a couple resources that we are talking about. Uh, the first one, I believe in the power of our words. Amen? Amen? I just finished reading a book by Mark Batterson called Please, Sorry, Thanks. And he talks about in his book that words create worlds. That your words create your world. And so every year we start off the year with the My Victory Word card. And uh, hundreds of people at Victory Church have posted on social media what their victory word is for the year, from resilience to confidence to uh, uh, leadership. And so if you haven't got one of these yet, please grab one on the way out, uh, or, or you can go to our, our church page and you can see uh, many people's words. And also, uh, we've got these journals uh, that we've been handing out. We ordered 1,500 of these and ran out last week. And so if you did not get a journal, we have more ordered. It's a great thing for you guys not only to, uh, to hear the word, but then to write down what the Holy Spirit's speaking to your heart so you can go back and look, you know, one month, six months, one year from now, oh, God did something special in my heart, and I want to, you know, document that. And then lastly, as I said last weekend, uh, one of the books that I, I read in preparation for this teaching series is a book called Divine Direction by Craig Chrishell. And so a lot of, uh, of, of, of the insights uh, that I'm communicating uh, came as a result of reading this book. And so it's a phenomenal book. Um, I saw somebody this week at a restaurant, and uh, they said, hey, I bought that book, Divine Direction. And, man, it's a powerful. It's on the uh, you know, decision-making process. And so I thought, well, thank you. I'm glad you read that. All right, so for our teaching series, Everyday Victory, we're asking this question. And, and I was... I was I always put too much pressure. Anybody else, like you put too much pressure on yourself for sometimes what nobody else really cares about? Like you've got like maybe eight, you know, third graders coming to your house for a sleepover for your daughter's birthday party, and you're like, you know, cleaning under the fridge. Like, I got to put a lot of pressure, make sure the house, you know, and you know, nobody else cares. Like no third graders like, hey, Mrs. Smith, under the fridge looked great. I just wanted to let you know that. So I put all this pressure on these questions, but I hope that uh, there's not only depth but it creates discussion when you begin to process uh, these questions. So the question we're looking at for this teaching series is, do you, by faith, have the courage to start a discipline that changes the direction of your story? And we looked at that last week, and we started to develop, okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. It takes courage to, to get to your, eventually to your calling. And a lot of us, we, we have a calling, but we're just trying to figure out how do we get there. And so do you, by faith, have the courage to start a discipline that changes the direction of your story? And so one of the things we highlighted last week, and we'll use this as, as a template for the rest of the teaching series, is that to get to your calling, okay, you have to have the courage to go through your comfort zone to get to your calling. And that's, that's difficult. We're going to unpack that in a little bit. Because a lot of us, we, we wonder, okay, well, how do, I, how do I get started? Well, it's always through courage. 
trying to get through that comfort zone is difficult, but then God's got a calling on your life. And I just want to take just a moment, because I think a lot of times people look at me and they're like, well, I don't have a calling to be a pastor or to lead a Bible study, but all of us have a calling to do something significant spiritually for the kingdom of God. Amen? It might be, and I remember reading this many, many years ago. Sometimes your greatest contribution to the kingdom of God is not something you say or something you do, but someone that you raise or someone's grandchildren that you have influence over. And so, so often we look, we're like, well, I'm not, you know, I don't have 10,000 followers on Instagram or I'm not, I don't have a platform to speak on. We all have a platform to demonstrate God's purpose for our life. It might just be that you're the best fifth grade teacher that that school's ever seen, and you're raising people to not, not you know, uh, give in to what culture has to say. It might be that you're a, a phenomenal parent, that you're the most faithful employee, or that you do start a Bible study, or that you do do something significant. So God has called all of us to do something incredible. And so I'm going to recap a little bit of James 1, and I want to build uh, my conversation today as we jump into James chapter 2 with this big idea, Okay. There is a difference, there is a difference between the event of becoming a Christian and the decision to become a disciple. Come on, 9 a.m., come on, 9 a.m., let me say it again, front rows with me, front rows with me, all right. There is a difference between the event of becoming a follower of Jesus, of becoming a Christian, and the decision to become a disciple. There's two things, okay? Now, I'm about to go a little bit deeper into our first, you know, second weekend of the year, do a deep dive into this. Um, When you say yes to Jesus, when you acknowledge I'm a sinner, I need a Savior, I ask God to forgive me of my sins, I accept his grace, you are saved. Acts chapter 4 verse 12 says, there's no other name given to men by which we must be saved than the name of Jesus. So you are saved. Eternity is Heaven is your home, amen? That's called salvation. But then there is this process, a uh, big churchy word coming in three, two, one, sanctification, that you will spend the rest of your life becoming who God created you to be. God created you on purpose, for a purpose, and he doesn't want just the experience of salvation to be the end game. That's not the finish line. Saying yes to Jesus is not the Woo! Hell insurance, I'm good. Stamp the hand, I'm good. Got a mansion in heaven, I'm good. Now, salvation is it's amazing. It's everything. But then there's this process that we go through called sanctification, where not only is Jesus Lord of your life, salvation, he becomes the, I'm sorry, not only is he Savior of your life, salvation, but he becomes Lord of your life, sanctification. Now, that's difficult. Because um, aren't there areas in your life that you've yet to give God? Okay, just me. Okay, <laughs> Nobody said amen. <laughs> no, I'm good, pastor. I'm good. I surrender all. There are, there are areas in our lives where we've all yet to submit to God because we know what God will do. And I'll, I'll give you one that we all can probably connect with. Um, it'll make us all mad, but that's fine. We'll all be mad. Well, all of us but 4%. According to church metrics, according to church metrics, 96% of Christians, followers of Jesus, have yet to make Jesus Lord of their life in the area of finances. Just wanted to let you know. So there is an area that we can begin to trust God in right there. Okay, we can go into entertainment, we can go into attitude on Monday morning, we can go into all kinds of disciplines. So let's jump in. Last week we talked about In James chapter 1, if you're ready for God's word, we're going to say I'm ready on the count of three. One, two, three. We looked at James. And just to recap a little bit, um, James chapter 1, it says, When troubles of any kind come your way, I forgot my my box. It says that when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Now that word opportunity is like a I'm going to be calm in the middle of this difficult situation. So whenever troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity 
for great joy because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Now, perseverance, the imagery that James gives is, uh, it's, a, it's an illustration almost. It's a Greek word called hupmana, and it means to be underneath a heavy weight without wanting to escape it quickly. And most of the time, when we go through something that is difficult, it could be a relational tension, it could be a, uh, some sort of you know, a, a emotional struggle, we, we often want to get out of it as quickly as possible. And what James says is, when, when we consider the, the thing that we're going through, don't, don't be so quick just to rush through and not learn the lesson. Anybody ever gone through something, but you didn't learn the lesson, and so you repeated it? I'll give you an example. Why does it seem like my credit card debt never seems to go down? Okay, I'm just coming at our finances in January, aren't I? Or I'll use one that's also kind of awesome. Why does it seem like my weight just keeps fluctuating? Because you love the Oreos. You know what they did? They came out with these Oreos called, uh, what are they called? Thin? Thin, thin or Man, they're brilliant. When you're underneath the heavy weight, whether it be a diet of discipline or a diet of how you discuss your day with your spouse, learn the lesson. And then when you learn the lesson, what you were once under, by faith, you'll be able to sit on one day. And use it as a platform of, oh, my finances used to be jacked up. Oh, my weight used to really fluctuate. But I, by faith, made a courageous decision to start a discipline that changed the direction of my story. And I want to tell you how that I do it. Here's how you can do it. So James is saying, these are opportunities that we have. And I don't want you just to be so quick to hit the eject button, just to pull the ripcord on what God is doing for you. Okay, let's jump into chapter 2. James then says, my brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. He says, you must not show favoritism. Now, he uses the word glorious, which is a throwback to the Old Testament. Talks about the Shekinah glory of God. You ever heard that term? Shekinah glory of God. Meaning that we reflect the brightness, the glory of God. He says, we, brothers and sisters, like when we come together, we shouldn't show favoritism. And as I'm reading chapter 2, and I'm like, wait a minute, James. This is what you want to discuss? You ever sat down with somebody, maybe you do like a year-end review at work or you talk to your kids and, and, and you, hey, I have something I want to talk about, you know, and, and it seems so insignificant. James, you want to talk about favoritism? Okay, well, let's navigate in. We're all supposed to read chapter two. Let's do it. He then says, suppose, and James was really, really big into creating these, these scenarios where he kind of poses a, maybe a hypothetical or a parable-like form. Where did he learn that? Well, he watched his brother, Jesus, and in case you're unfamiliar, James was the half-brother of Jesus. So James grew up watching Jesus. James also saw the ministry of Jesus from age 30 to age 33. But one of the things that James didn't do was believe that Jesus was the Messiah. In John chapter 7, it documents that James and his brothers were skeptics of Jesus, and it says they scoffed at him. Basically, they're like, oh, whatever, Jesus, you go, this is weird, you go do what you want to do, we don't believe you. It's not until 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that James believes that Jesus is indeed the Messiah, and what happened? The resurrection. And so James is then like, you are the Lord and Savior, you are the Messiah. And so he begins this whole hypothetical with, suppose, suppose. A man comes into your meeting or your church gathering place wearing a gold ring and fine clothes. And a poor man in filthy clothes also comes in. Okay, so one guy comes in decked out in Gucci. One guy comes in straight from Goodwill. Okay, got Gucci and Goodwill. Doesn't get any more opposite. In fact, in the first century, people would actually rent their clothes 
or rent jewelry or rent you know, these different items in order to impress the people around them. You ever met somebody who lived beyond their means to impress people that nobody else really cares about? I know, I, me either. Isn't it awesome that in 2,000 years we progressed to such a point where we no longer care about what other people think, that we have to rent things and live beyond our means? The reason why so often people get offended or people get bothered when I mention our finances or I mention leveling up in our generosity is because the average American spends $1.09 for every $1 that they earn. And then when somebody like me stands up and says something like, I want you to be generous. I want to further the kingdom of God and do something influential in our community. You get upset because of the shame and the guilt of your undisciplined spending. And you don't know what to do with that shame or that guilt. So you just get mad at me. Now, I don't want you to experience shame and guilt. I want you to, by faith, have the courage to start a discipline that changes the direction of your story. I want to say two words, and they, they aren't cuss words, okay, just so you know. Write them down slowly. When you get in your car, you can tell your kids, pastor did not cuss. We just, we just don't do that, okay? Two words are very powerful. Debt free. Wouldn't that be awesome? So James is saying, suppose somebody comes in looking great. Somebody come in looking kind of poor. He says, if you, if you show, verse number 3, chapter 2, verse 3, if you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a seat for you. But you say to the poor man, you stand there or you sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with your evil thoughts? Now, one of the things I love about victory is that, like, there are no assigned seats, except that one right there. That's where I sit. That's, okay. we, we actually, uh, again, it was such a celebration Easter weekend, five services, and I think three of the five, my seat got taken. And I was like, praise God. Whew, that's awesome. But there's this tension James is trying to wrestle with, with discrimination. He says, listen, my dear brothers and sisters, verse number five. Has God not chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world? And you could, you know, put it in parentheses there, culture. Poor in the eyes of culture. To be rich in faith and inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him. Now, James is not saying poor monetarily. He's not saying, like, oh, those poor Christians. You know, like, like the world looks at these followers of Jesus, and they're like, oh, they're, they're poor and lowly. No, he's not saying poor monetarily is how the, the world looks, you know, down on us. I think what he's saying is that there are people that look at this, and as we unpack it again, he says that they, has God not chosen those that are poor in the eyes of the world? We're poor in the eyes of the world, not because of our income, but because we basically have values that the world wishes that they had. You ever, you ever met somebody that, that they, they're going through something incredibly difficult, yet they're full of peace? And you wonder, how in the world are they so full of peace when it seems like everything around them is chaotic? You ever met somebody that's going through something unimaginable in their, their, their health, yet they still have the joy of the Lord? So what James is referencing is they may not have income like the world wants, but they have values and virtues that God has called them rich. And that's what the world covets. In James chapter 2, verse 6, he says, but you've dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? They're like, yeah, actually they are. Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the name of him to whom you belong? And then, now he's about to give us a little bit of theology. He says, if you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, which is love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing right. Okay. So he says, this is good. This is good. That whole love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and love your neighbors yourself. That's good. Now, this next verse. You ready for a big boy verse? I didn't think so. Ready for a big boy verse. Okay, here we go. He says, but if you show favoritism, 
Again, not a cuss word, but here we go. You sin, and you are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. Now again, James to me, the book of James, you could read the book of James Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, start over, and every week this year you would grow spiritually just by reading the book of James. It is phenomenal. I've read the book of James so many times, and every time I, I see something new. He says, if you show favoritism, you sin. Again, I'm like, wait a minute, James. You want to use favoritism as your big macro point in life? Is there anything else that you want to do? I think what James was trying to do is to get people to see. Whether it's the greatest thing or whether it's the most insignificant thing, sin is sin. The reason why he wants us to be on the same page is because a lot of times when it comes to sin, we very easily self-deceive ourselves. We very easily self something like that. You got it. We can fool ourselves pretty quickly when it comes to our sin. Psychologists call this a cognitive bias where you don't want to believe that you're a sinner. You're just a mistaker. You just say things like, I was having a bad day. Or, my bad. Or, oops, I didn't mean to do that. I'm going, I'm going through a season. It's been difficult for me. And, and we have this cognitive bias. I was listening to a podcast this week, and it was talking about why we deceive ourselves so much. And, and when it comes to things that we know we shouldn't do, why do we deceive ourselves and justify it? And there were, he, these were the top five in the podcast. It was saying that a lot of us, we have distraction addiction. That we don't want to listen to what the Holy Spirit has to say to our heart. So we'll distract ourselves with everything else, uh, mostly our phones. It's been estimated that we'll touch our phone a few thousand times a day. Because we, all we want is distraction. We'll watch TV, we'll play video games, we'll turn the music up, we'll look at our phone. Because if we slow ourselves down... And we're not distracted. The Holy Spirit wants to speak, and we don't want to hear what he has to say. The other thing that we do oftentimes to deceive ourselves is we do what the podcast says here. Manic cheeriness. You ever met somebody that's always awesome? Life is good. Everything's awesome. Best day ever. And listen, those are all great. I'm an optimist by nature. But there are some days that it just sucks. And even as a pastor, I know a good, mature pastor, and I probably should, I'm almost 50, should be a little more refined and say, well, it's just, we're just going through a valley. You know, some days just aren't as good as other days. I understand that, brother. But aren't there days you're just like, it sucks. It's okay to say, I'm having a really bad day. But I know that I'm going to learn a lesson from it. I know I'm going to consider this an opportunity. It's okay to sit in your struggle for a second. But don't stay there. But also, manic cheeriness is not a way to work your way through it. Judgmentalism. That's what we do when we're like, you know what? At least I'm not sinning as bad as them. Because if I focus on your sin, it makes me feel less convicted about my sin. And just because you sin differently than me makes my sin not feel as big to me. I didn't, nobody wrote that down. That's good. And of course, this is what we often do. We get defensive. And we start deflecting, we get defensive, and then lastly, we just get cynical. You know, everything's bad. The whole world's going to hell in a handbasket. There are some really great things happening in our world, amen? Yeah, there are some things that probably, you know, it's not like the sky's falling, but there are some things that are difficult. And so what happens is we have to go to recognize sin is sin. James then says, for whoever keeps the whole law yet stumbles at just one point, is guilty of breaking it all. Now, really what he's saying, this is maturity. This is theology 101. He's trying to get you to have a different perspective so that when you, by faith, by courage, make a decision, have a discipline, it will change the direction of your story. He's trying to get you to see things from a different perspective. Maturity is putting a process between opportunity and decision. That's huge. Now, next level, this is where I would write it down. This is why you came to church, to hear something this good. Write it down, take a picture of it. But this is biblical maturity. 
It's spiritual maturity is putting a biblically based process between opportunity and decision. Wait a minute. Let me see what God's word has to say about this. It may be legal, but it might not be beneficial. It might be something that is a a small gray area, but maybe God doesn't want me to compromise in that area. This is why James would say, and it's so powerful when he says, for he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not commit murder. That'd be Jesus. If you commit adultery, but do not commit murder, you've become a lawbreaker. Okay, now, we've just navigated through the challenging part of the text. Everybody say amen. Woo! Woo, that was tough. Thank you. I think everybody's still awake. He now takes it, and I don't know which one is more difficult, to navigate through like the deeper theological section of chapter 2 or to jump into the practical application of chapter 2. Because you thought that may have been a little bit like, I had to focus a little harder, Andy. That was a little bit tougher. Now this gets even more difficult. Watch what he says. Suppose. Let me lob this at you again. Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical need, Look at that last little phrase. What good is it? What good is it? That's why when I make statements like our church last year gave away over $200,000 to outreaches, missionaries, people that have a benevolent need. And when I say by faith in five years, our church will be a church that gives away $1 million to missionaries, outreach partners, benevolent needs. It requires all of us to be on the same page because somebody in need is on the other side of your obedience. You think about that. Why has God blessed you? Because there are families, there are people that are in need, and somebody in need is waiting on the other side of your obedience. James then says this, in the same way, this would be a great early year verse to memorize, in the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. Mm, mm, mm. Preach it, James. Now, let me, let, me, let me unpack this a little bit for you. Okay, here we go. Um, all right, here's what we've been, we've been talking about this. So we, we said, when a courage, go through our, our comfort zone, to get to our calling. In order to have courage, as we've said, do you, by faith, have the courage to start a discipline that changes the direction of your story? Well, in an area of courage, you have to have, you have to make a a decision. To get through your comfort zone, this is where a lot of us get stuck because you're caught in a dilemma. I'm going to unpack it in just a minute. And to get to your calling, this is the word that nobody likes, discipline. So let's just, let's just work this out, okay? Let's just, let's just say you, you have a calling to do something that you know is going to be difficult and it requires discipline. Well, do you have the courage to start or will you just say stuck? Out of your comfort zone, will you, look at this, will you stay or will you go? When it comes to your calling, will you say yes or will you say no? When, when I sit down with people, I've drawn that on a map or on a napkin at Bob Evans. What, it's easier sometimes to stay stuck because you like the negative attention that you sometimes get. Nobody said amen, but that's okay. Sometimes staying in your comfort zone oh, you know what, it's just, it's easier here. Beth and I were, were joking about this. We went and saw uh, Nate Bargatze, uh, I think that's how you say his last name, uh, phenomenal. I feel like half the church went and saw him, all the, all the social media posts. But he was talking about his dad, and his dad just turned 70. 
And he said his dad hit this spot when it comes to technology, when it comes to advancement. It was the self-checkout where his dad's like, I'm done. I'm done. I'm too old to deal with this new technology. And Beth and I were talking about it on the way home. And I was like, what will it be for us? Will it be AI, virtual reality, a robot in the living room? What will it be? Because I'm 50. I'm starting to say some stuff like shenanigans now. I'm walking through the lobby and seeing kids. Hey, knock off them shenanigans. I'm 50. I can say that stuff now. And, and I wonder what will it be where do I press through the comfort zone? Do I stay or do I go? And when it comes to your calling, will you say yes or no? Because you've got a decision, a dilemma to get to your discipline. And it's never going to be easy. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. Now, faith by itself is dead. Now, he gets to a point where he sees his audience is getting a little bit fatigued, kind of like you. But I have something for you. He then says this. He knows it'll rally the crowd. It's like when I say, oh, H. He knows it'll rally the crowd. So look what he does. He goes, was not our father Abraham? Oh, thank you for bringing it back, James. Father Abraham. Woo! I mean, people get geeked out. He knows his audience. He's like, oh, yeah. Look at, oh, they just all their eyes. Yeah. Father Abraham, founder of our faith. Yes. He says, was not, was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? Oh, man. He was. He was. I, I just told you on the way. Remember we were talking about Father Abraham and how he sacrificed? And he gets his audience all back reengaged. He says, you see that his faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete by what he did. His faith and his actions. I love when people tell me, well, if, if I had a platform like yours, I would do what you did. Well, okay, wait, 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 wait. I remember when Beth and I first came to Victory. I was so full of joy about being the pastor at Victory Church that I had ministerial friends that were like, why are you so excited about this? Isn't there like 20 people there? I know, but God's going to do something. I walked around this place like I'm the pastor at Victory Church. I made business cards. Vistaprint.com got 500 for 99 cents. We were born on a budget back then. I think so often we, we see what we want by faith, but we aren't willing to make the decision, answer accordingly when it comes to the dilemma, and develop the discipline. Faith was made complete by what he did. And he finishes talking about Abraham by saying, and the scripture was fulfilled saying, Abraham believed God. And it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. I would love it if the chapter ended right here. But it doesn't. He says, you see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. Okay. Amen, James. Why don't you have a stand and pray? James was like, hold on, I'm not done. Remember earlier he talked about let's not show favoritism to people? And he starts off with this super minute example of favoritism. That's what you want to call sin? Okay, okay James, that seems a little extreme, but I get it. Well, now he's going to bring it into our backyard because he uses Father Abraham like the, the icon of the Old Testament, the founder of our faith, as the illustration. And then look where he swings. He says, in the same way was not even Rahab, the prostitute, considered righteous. He just used Abraham and righteous and Rahab and righteous in the same sentence blasphemy no 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 for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction Rahab by faith had the courage to start a discipline to trust God and it changed the direction of her story 
I love that he uses the illustration of Father Abraham, founder of our faith, and then he goes to the complete opposite end of the spectrum of faith, according to some people, and uses Rahab. Let's pull that up just one more time. Rahab, let's look at, what is, in the same way even Rahab the prostitute. That way, in case there's anybody reading it then or reading it now, that they're like, well, who, who, who was Rahab? Like some of you right now, if your kids are in the room and you're like, oh, God, he just said prostitute. Don't say prostitute again, please. Uh, Rahab was a prostitute. We all know what that means, right? It's Thursday night. I had a family. They texted me about 945, and they said, hey, thanks, Pastor. On the way home, my kids said, Dad, what's a woman of the night? Because I felt like I said prostitute too many times, and I didn't want to keep saying the word prostitute, because if you had kids in the room, they'd be like, he said prostitute. Dad, what's prostitute? Which is why your kids probably should have gone to kids' church today. So I didn't say prostitute anymore. I just said woman of the night. <laughs> Dad, what's woman of the night mean? Next week, your kid will be in kids' church. <laughs> he uses Abraham. He also uses Rahab because both of them, by faith, had the courage to start a discipline that changed the direction of their story. Would you stand with me? <clears throat> James then says this, closing verse. As the body without the spirit is dead, Okay, I understand that. As the body without the spirit is dead. So faith without work is dead. So what is the decision that you need to make? You'll go through a dilemma. And to get to your calling, it'll take discipline. I often come into weekend messages I've, I've spent countless hours praying and preparing, but when it comes to actually speaking, presenting it, I say, God, I, I need you to do what I can't do. I need you to, to go beyond the joint and the marrow, go beyond just the epidermis of our faith and, and get down where, where change really, really happens. Change is never easy. As I said earlier, when Beth and I first came to Victory, I, I knew God wanted to do something special. And um, you ever gone through something, but you didn't have a template for it? Um, like have a kid? <laughs> Faith without action is dead. When Beth and I first had, you know, Brooklyn, I was like, I, I don't know how to be a dad. I always want to make sure I balance this. I, I love my dad. My dad and I have a, have a good relationship, but I learned a lot of what not to do with the way that my dad was a dad, and it fueled me to be a better dad. I didn't have a blueprint to be a godly dad. So when Beth and I got married, we, we looked at, at other families, and we leaned into what we did know, and we said, hey, we want to we you know, see what you do and, and, and see the decisions you've made, the dilemmas you went through, the discipline that you developed. Because in order for us to, to have courage and go through our uncomfortable zone, we have to get to the calling that God has for our life. And so we, we did it. it. Might be a small group. You want to launch a small group. and you, I don't know what to do. You got the Bible and Google. You know what to do now. There's a, there's a blueprint. You become the template. You become the blueprint. So our, our church started growing. So I started asking people, hey, what do you do when, when, when the church starts growing? And, and, and we had this little sign on the wall, and it was a, a building code that told us how many people could be in the room. It was 208 in our old worship center. I remember one weekend we had like 230-something. So, well, we're in violation. So we had to start a second service, and then we did a third service, then a fourth service, and eventually had a five service. I was like, well, this is nuts. So I thought, well, maybe we should build. I'd have a blueprint for building. And so the thing that I was once under, that I was now sitting on as an example, I had to realize that there was something inside. Ooh, this is good, Andy. This is good, good, good. 
I always wanted to do this. This is, um, this is the first blueprint of what we were going to do many years ago. Um, we were just going to add uh, a little addition to our old worship center to maybe increase it from 208 seats to 330 seats or 340 seats. This was the first blueprint. I knew nothing about building, but I knew that by faith, God wanted to do something. So we met with the builder and we said, hey, can we, can we do this? And he said, yeah, we can definitely do that. And so I said, well, let's, let's get ready to do it. Well, the church just kept growing. And so we put this blueprint back and This became the blueprint for what we're currently sitting in. Isn't that amazing? Sometimes I still think I don't know what I'm doing, but God is doing something in our church that by faith is beyond all of us. It's collectively something incredibly special. I was telling myself, don't get all emotional and start crying or anything. But when we, when we did this blueprint, it was about $300,000. It might as well have been $300 million. I was like, oh, no, <laughs> Lord. Uh, uh, some people haven't made the discipline to uh, start giving to church yet, so this, is, this seems impossible. This was $300,000. This is $3 million. And look where we're standing now. Don't be so quickly to get out from underneath the pressure, the dilemma, the conviction. Because God wants to help you learn the lesson so that one day you'll be able to sit on as a platform what God did for you, but it's going to come from inside. And that's difficult for some of us because we want to know, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm the same way, we want to know, wait a minute, God, if you want to get me there, tell me how to get there now. Well, the Bible says in Psalms chapter 118, I believe, that the word of God is a, it's a lamp unto my feet and a light into my path. God's going to give you one step at a time. I've gone way too long. Sorry about that. But it's cold outside, so might as well just hang out in here. <laughs> Thanks for watching with us today. And here's how I want to end. Um, I said this last week, by faith, I pray you'll have the courage to start a discipline that changes the direction of your story. By faith, courage to start a discipline that changes the direction of your story. So here's how I want to wrap up today. And again, thank you. I got, I, got, I got carried away there. I went like eight minutes over. My apologies. I pray, here's my closing prayer, that by faith, you will have the courage to stay the course and be faithful where you've been planted, even when it would be easier to throw in the towel and just walk away. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray that together, um, eyes open, just because you, you can't read and pray at the same time with your eyes closed. So let's pray this together. I trust that you're praying it with me. God, I pray that by faith, you will have the courage to stay the course and be faithful where you've been planted. And even it will be easier to throw in the towel and just walk away. Personalize that as we close in prayer. Would you bow your heads with me now? Where's the, easy, where's the area right now? It'd be easier to walk away. It'd be easier to sign the divorce papers. It'd be easier to look for a new job. It'd be easier to just be an absentee dad. It'd be easier just to fall into the old patterns because it was comfortable. But by faith, but by faith, God has a level for you that he wants you to lead at. So I pray right now, whether it be financial, whether it be something faith-related, something emotional, God, today, I pray your blessing over every person that they begin to experience the Holy Spirit leading them to a new level in their life so that they can lead at that level 
and be the influence that they want to be to their family, their coworkers, their neighbors. Because God, you're doing something special so we can experience everyday victory. In Jesus' name I pray. And together we all say, let's tell God how good he is. Amen. Amen. Well, have a great day. Don't miss next week. Appreciate you. They don't know who I am. They never